Coast project. I started it as a school project last year while I was uh, in my second year at Kent State taking cultural heritage informatics. Uh, I grew up in Columbus. I've come and gone many times over the years. Uh, this sculpture of Chief Leatherlitz was erected um, towards the end of my high school years, and um, it's by sculptor Ralph Helmick, who lives in Boston. Ralph Helmick is known for doing these stacked mortar, stone limestone portraits of historic figures throughout the United States. I really didn't know what this was, and I had an opportunity to document something out there in culture, uh, whether it's a building or a public artwork or some other thing that someone had wondered about. And uh, this class is taught by Marcia Zhang, Professor Marcia Zhang at uh, Kent, who is a um, kind of world-known, internationally known metadata and cultural heritage informatics specialist. And um, so this was a really exciting opportunity for me to find out more. Well, I got a whole lot more than I bargained for. <laughs> which is that the life and death of Chief Leatherlips is largely inaudible, invisible, and undocumented. This sculpture is of a man who was executed by Tomahawk to the head by members of his own tribe during a period of what can only be called incredible swirl in the year 1810, a time when Tecumseh from this region is rising up again rebellion against the Treaty of Greenville, which formed modern-day Ohio. Leatherlitz was observing, uh, he observed uh, his signature on the treaty, which drew the survey line from Pennsylvania, north of Columbus, across Indiana, relocated all Native Americans north into the northwest quadrant of the states. He was a sign of the times, and he was the beginning of what can only be truly called racial cleansing. You can stand on the sculpture, it's quite large. That's my daughter hanging out back there. So the website can be used for who knows what, I just started doing it. I first documented and photographed Chief Leatherlips and I wrote a work record. The class was teaching how to write work records about both tangible and intangible cultural heritage. So not just buildings, public artworks, but also ritual, human experience, and things that are generally not documented, and quite frankly are often lost to history because they aren't documented. The story over the past year has gone in a lot of different places and a lot of fragments and small pieces. So um, you know, to repeat what I began with, I had always wondered about Chief Leatherlips. His gravestone stands on Route 33. If you're driving up 33 along the Scioto River going to the zoo, and you happen to look to the right at the side of a condominium development called Edgewater, you're going to see a solitary gravestone. This is perhaps where Leather Lips was tomahawked in the head by Roundhead, who was another porcupine and clan member of the Wyandotte tribe. I never learned about this in school, and I had very disconnected memories and knowledge of this grave along Route 33. I remember seeing it and kind of thinking, huh, what's that? But then kind of forgetting about it again. So in all of this is so far incredible complexity, undocumented history, fragments, a need to do oral history in order to find what the story is, and a major lack of tangible information. So to kind of repeat here what, what I'm talking about, because I'm still learning about this too, Chief Leatherlips was a Wyandotte village chief who was executed by Tomahawk to the head by Roundhead, also a Wyandotte. He was executed for technically male witchcraft, politics, observance of the Wyandotte signing of the Treaty of Greenville, 
Wyandotte people were observing the Treaty of Greenville because they saw the writing on the wall, according to the Wyandotte Nation now, that the battles were going to be lost in Ohio. Leatherlips was also murdered in part for his friendliness with the white settlers in what is now Dublin, Ohio, which is an affluent white municipality on the northwest side of Columbus. It's starting to change now. The story in Dublin is definitely starting to change. It's a really hard story to tell. It's a really hard story to explain quickly. It's a much harder story than I anticipated finding. The life and death of Chief Leatherlips is told in part through oral history recollections by white men, settlers to Dublin, and is held in digitized journals and PDFs and local libraries archives in the Ohio's history connection. Leatherlips is memorialized not by the Wyandotte Nation, but by country clubs and by the white community. The execution has been mythologized. The legacy of Leather Lips exists as a ghost story with racist undertones. So, for example, there's a curse of Leather Lips that Leather Lips makes it rain at the Muirfield Golf Tournament. An archive I found at the Columbus Library. There's a um, story about Jack Nicholas's wife leaving whiskey out at the grave. That's a good luck to him something that's done regularly. The Wyandotte Nation now takes a hard line against another Wyandotte figure who's known in Columbus as the last of the Wyandots. Very debatable. Um, takes a hard line against Bill Moose, the last of the Wyandots in Columbus, who performed with the Sells Brothers Circus. Okay, another variable, very complicated. Sells Brothers Circus was the second largest early American circus. This is all comes spilling out of the mouthless sculpture of Chief Leatherlips. I've been mulling this over now for a good year, and I still don't understand. We don't know what Leatherlips looked like. We don't know what he sounded like. We don't know how old he was. There are two pictorial representations of him. They're both imagined renderings. One is the sculpture. One is a, he appears in the painting The Treaty of Greenville at the State House, crouching in the corner. The rest is lost. Other Wyandotte chiefs and leaders are represented visually in postcards and painted portraits, particularly at the Watt Federal Wyandotte Mission in Upper Sandusky. It just so happens that this weekend is the 200 year anniversary of the Mission Church which is the one and only church that was funded by the federal government in America. Leather Lips is, as portrayed by Helmut, what he remains today, voiceless, mouthless, silent, possibly forgotten. So, over here are some postcards from the Wyandotte Mission Church in Upper Sandusky, Ohio. It's about an hour, hour and 20 minutes north of Columbus. The Wyandotte people walked up and down the Scioto River. The history of the Wyandotte people in Ohio is largely lost. Upper Sandusky was the stronghold. The Wyandotte people actually had governance of Ohio for a portion of time as Native Americans. Um, according to Wyandotte historian Lloyd Devine, who I literally just met this week, like literally this week, the story just went another domino effect because I was able to talk to the Wyandotte Nation. The other lips story would be forgotten, totally, it missing, were it not for the archives of the Moravian Christian Church. A completely other, very complicated story. This gravestone, erected by the Wyandotte Country Club, and the Helmick sculpture, and now, most important information about leather looks is online. What you can find really is all online. I did almost all of this project through, did, through internet searching so far. And now I'm going back to the ground and I'm doing interviews. So I'm trying to stitch this together. 
because there are pieces and parts all over the place. Through interviews with the Wyandotte Nation cultural stewards and historians, the Wyandotte Mission Church, John Stewart Methodist Church in Upper Sandusky, through archives with the Ohio History Connection, the Columbus Historical Society, local public libraries and church archives, which I need to read through the Methodist and the Moravian archives, and, and internet searches where I found a bulk of information through digital collections and wayward bits of information. Every time I change the search term, the organization of the words, it's like weird digital bones rise to the surface, I'll find something else. It's all in the searching. So, documentation is what we're talking about with cultural heritage informatics. And it's about finding information where it is in all its forms, through field trips, through exploration, through research, unearthing the invisible, what's quiet, what's silent, what is unseen, finding real history. Not history, but the real history. Not the true or the false, but what, what's real. So what is documentation? Susan Briey was a French woman known as Madame Documentation. She was a librarian, author, historian, poet, and visionary. Coined this term documentation, it was a, a, it's a named field. The act of documentation in information science is literally the fixing the act of the gazelle running as it runs. There's the gazelle, there's the running, and then there's the act of the running. So as a teaching tool, I'm happy to share this website. I think this is incredibly powerful to teach at all levels, with adults, with K-12, with college students. This story I don't think would work with anyone younger than ninth grade. It's too complicated and too hard and too brutal and too gruesome. But what active learning through creativity means is do it yourself, taking photos, recording sounds, shooting videos, writing down thoughts, creating websites, book podcasts, videos, drawings, interpretations, what you're looking at, what you're, what you're coming to understand, hyperlinking facts through critical thinking. Am I associating ideas right? That's what I've done on my website. What I'm finding is that I haven't always. Because when you do internet searches, those are fragments that may or may not be real history. Investigating relationships, searching for information to stitch these fragments together through careful work, what my piano teacher called donkey work, through libraries and archives, through web searches and through oral history and interviews, and using best practices in ethnography, field reporting, documentary, and journalism, which are some of the things we that were presented this morning about citation, citations, permissions, um, all of the things that go along with the perils of the internet. And what is real history? You know, the story just it continues to change as I talk to more people who hold knowledge and authority on the subject of the Wyandotte people. That group right now is the Wyandotte Nation. Most of mostly in Oklahoma. Um, there are uh, three to four, there are four chiefs in the Wyandotte Nation. Now one in Canada, Oklahoma, Detroit, and then there is a fourth that I'm still, I just made contact this week, so still I'm not sure where the fourth person is. Um, the Wyandotte history and cultural experience is not the same as the history of Central Ohio, but Forced relocation of the Wyandotte people created a number of red threads that connect everything through this diaspora. Respect and care. The forced relocation of an entire people is a very difficult story to tell. This is the American story. So the story of the Wyandotte people is not my story. I don't know exactly what my project is, it's a documentation of the sculpture, but it implicates many, many things. Um, and there are many different directions that the red threads go in, and I'm follow, trying to follow those as well. 
Connecting historical dots is difficult and many different people are in many different locations and they all hold parts of this puzzle that literally kind of blew apart in 1843. So what is the story? Are things really related and are they true? And uh, we don't have time to do that. Here's my information and uh, if you're interested I can give you the, the website is just chiefletherlips.wordpress.com. So.